Hi, students, and welcome. It's really glad to be here with you today, and I hope that your studies in counseling and being great counselors and therapists is uh, paying off. You know, as you've been going through the process, you know, counseling is the sort of a grad degree that's not like a, you know, you're, you're, you, know, you don't know what you're doing, you're kind of an idiot, and all of a sudden you're an expert. It's a process of growth, and hopefully by now you're um, enjoying being with the clients and feeling like some level of competency and some level of... Um, Gosh, I know where this is going. I can predict things and that sort of thing. Because that's the joy. I mean, I'm, I'm a healer at heart like you are, and that's what I enjoy. Um, <clears throat> if you've got your handouts today, uh, this is a special talk because um, back when we started, um, we had a talk, a didactic on the grief process, what the God and, the, and science tell us about the letting go. Well, look at this as advanced because I've learned a lot since we did this um, and also, fa fairly recently, at the, as of the time of this recording, um, less than a month ago, my mother died. And um, I had to go through rethinking everything I believe and feel about, uh, about grief and, and experienced it myself. It's been a very sad time with me, for me. But a couple of things for you guys' purposes. One is um, I'm even more convinced of the value of teaching our clients and experiencing our clients' grief and, and all the things that God brings to the process with it, how, how helpful it is. And secondly, um, I see now um, how it makes you a better person. So you've, I'm going to assume you've got you know, the, the, the former teaching. We're going to build on that from now. But I've got a, um, I've got a great um, a great. Bible verse to start off with, and it's from Genesis 37, 35, and these are the words of, um, these are the words of Jacob, or, or from Jacob, about Jacob, I should say. Um, it says, all his, that's Jacob, all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn. He was talking about Joseph, whom he thought was, has passed away. I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Now, why would I pick out that passage to talk about this? Because if you read it, you understand that Jacob understood that comfort and grief would bring resolution and joy. And of course, he, he, is, he is consciously pushing away the comfort. I don't want it because I, I will con I have, I've chosen to, to, because of my sense of loss and, and love and longing for my son, I will, I'm choosing to mourn for him until I die. We call that delayed bereavement. And you're going to have a lot of clients who have losses that they don't metabolize and can't metabolize for lots of reasons. And the, the fact is, though, is that relationship goes a long, long way. Internal and external relationship go a long, long way to help us with the process of grief. So um, just a, a word or two about my mother. That's always helped to understand the person that um, left is that Becky, Becky, Becky was her name, um, she uh, was probably a child prodigy, or uh, prodigy, and grew up as a prodigy uh, in music. She was what's called a coloratura soprano, which is the highest level, or not the highest level, but the, the, the highest voice, very, very high voice, and won all sorts of awards. And uh, then she fell in love with and married my father, who is a jazz pianist. He was like an Art Tatum, Oscar Peterson type guy, if you understand that. I like that kind of music. I like it a lot. And then she raised four kids, me and my three sisters, and we, we were like a Von Trapp family. I mean, we were performing all over and did family things. And so music was a really, really big part of my life. And um, uh, as she got older, you know, she stayed in the music world. I mean, she didn't go professionally anymore, but um, she, was probably a, she was probably 50 to 60 years as a music director at various churches around Wilson, North Carolina, where I grew up, and was a, well, and a, and a music teacher, too, very, very well known and loved. Um, and um, funny story, when Henry Cloud and I wrote the book Mom Factor, which maybe uh, I believe it's in our cur curriculum about mom pathologies, you know, the absent mom and the phantom mom and all that, um, our publisher sort of freaked out, and they went, you're, you're bashing mom. Don't mash mom. Christians can't bash mom. I said, we're not bashing mom. We love our mothers. And so uh, to calm our publishers down, we said, look, let's, move, let, let's fly our parents out here. Henry's parent mom was in Vicksburg. My mom was in North Carolina. Fly them out here to California where we are, do a photo shoot, and have us, you know, here with our moms to say we're friends with our mothers. We're not bashing mom. We love mom. But how do you redeem the relationship and improve it? So I said, okay. So I flew my mother out there, and she gets off the plane, and she, we're going to the photo shoot and, shoot, and she says, no, what's this about? 
And I said, look, I, I know you don't read my books. You just show them to your friends, but that's okay. But here's what the book's about, about these six types of mothering. You know, the American Express mother you can't live home without, leave home without her, and the trophy mom, blah, 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 the six types. And I said, about how to have a better relationship, and every mom has one of these six issues at least. So she said, let me see that book. So I showed it to the manuscript to her, and there's the six types, the description. And she's reading it, and she looks, and after about a minute, she goes, okay, I'm this one, and I'm... I'm this one, and I'm never going to change. And I said, don't worry, I know. <laughs> and we were just friends about it. Kind of, that was Becky Townsend. She was just whoever she was. She was what she was. And for good and for bad, and that's what I loved about it. I think they kind of built a lot of good things into me as a person. So uh, me and my family uh, and uh, her grandkids and my, my wife, Barbie, and all the other spouses, we miss her a lot. Wonderful person. So... Um, let me go into why this is important. First, if you have your, uh, your outline, um, this in the introduction section, one reason this is important is because to the extent that you grieve well is the extent that you optimize what's inside you. Um, great grief can metabolize the good impacts and heal from the bad impacts of significant relationships. It can optimize your function. You'll be a better person, whether your client is um, an executive or your client's a parent, or your client is um, in the pastor or whatever, they'll be a better person. You think about Matthew 21 when Jesus said you got to keep the cup cleaned out. It's how you keep the cup cleaned out and full of healthy things because people that can't grieve or don't grieve, that cup has still got that person in there in some kind of like a, a paralyzed state and they can't take in new things and new, new ideas and new energy and new love and new passion and this sort of thing because that person's stuck there. So... The advantage for your client, more energy, more focus, more clarity, better mood, better relationships, more efficiency, um, growing past deficits. And if you don't do it, I promise you, um, effectiveness and optimization go away. So, very important thing. Now, let me talk about it on a metabolic level you see in your outline. Um, as I was thinking about this, because I spent so much time the last month thinking about my mom and feeling things about my mom and grieving with my family, this sort of thing. Um, look at it this way, is that the brain uses grief in a very similar way that the digestive system, our stomach and GI tract and, and all, you know, the, what's that thing, the colon and the upper and lower intestines, the same way that they use what we eat. The brain uses grief that way. Suppose you've got a favorite steak you like. You love, you know, I'm a ribeye guy, right? And so when you eat your ribeye, then ingredients like pepsin and other sort of um, breaking down ingredients that are strong, they begin to break down that ribeye so that it can be brought down to its essential elements and then useful to the body. And then it goes on and um, if you've got like toxins in that, in that ribeye, maybe there's some mercury there or whatever, it'll process that out. So it, it helps you, your, 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 um, your blood system and your cells and your bones and your skin and your muscles to use the good things and it processes out the bad things, right? Well, with healthy grief, it's the very, very same um, uh, uh, system. We use the person's good impact in our lives to be healthy and effective. Becky, my mom, you know, I think I'll always be sort of a people person. She was very much a people person. I think I'll always be pretty positive. She was very much positive. And, um, um, and, I've, and I've, I've always been interested in, you know, life and things and kind of a right brainer. I mean, that's, I've, I've used the things she built into me that she was. Um, but we also process out, the, process out the negatives through forgiveness and healing. I'm not going to tell you which two she was in the mom factor. That's private information. But, you know, I've been able to use the grief process to process out the things that my mom wasn't so great about, just because in the same way that I wasn't perfect with my kids either, and, and they've had to process out the things, the, the mercury in the system that I wasn't so great about through the grief process of forgiving and healing. But when the stomach doesn't have ingredients like pepsin and these other sort of more acidic things, that ribeye gets stuck, and it stays there. It doesn't do anybody good. You, you, you feel bloated. It doesn't feed you. You get weak because it's not breaking down the essential elements. And also, the mercury doesn't get processed out. The bad stuff doesn't get processed out. You're stuck with that. That's the same thing if you're not grieving. So that's why on a metabolic level, that's really why we're doing it. That's why God created something. That's why he says in Isaiah chapter 53, he says that Jesus was a person well acquainted with sorrow. You need, you, as a counselor, a healthy counselor, 
and your people need to be well acquainted with sorrow because then you can break down the good and get rid of the bad and then that person's useful to you. That's the internalization process we've been talking to you about here at the Institute forever. All right, look at the organic section next. Um, what I have discovered is that there are really two ways to, and I don't mean either or, there are two ways both and to grief. One is spontaneous, it kind of hits you, and you gotta be open to it. Like, um, you know, I was sitting with my wife um, at dinner and uh, a song came on that reminded me of my mother and I just started weeping and, you know, she just kind of comforted me and it took a few minutes and I just said some things I missed about her and that was it. Now, I could not have made that up, I could not have, you know, intentionally done that, but I was open to it. A lot of people get really busy right after they agree, right after they are lost, they stay busy, and um, that doesn't work. You, what you've got to do is be open to that happening, because here's, and I think I talked about this in the first talk, is that look at grief as the ocean, and you're a little rowboat, or you're in a little rowboat, that's us, you know, the ocean's bigger, grief is bigger than us, and we can't control it, and if you're a control freak, it's gonna drive you crazy, you better give in to it. And so the rowboat can't say to the ocean, hey, the waves are too high, make them small. The ocean's gonna do whatever it does. And so you don't tell grief what to do. You can certainly postpone it if you need to. If you're, you know, if you're having a big meeting or a, you know, you're working with your, your tax accountant or whatever, you're working in therapy, you can't just start to you know, go for a clamp. I mean, you, you gotta put that aside. But you have to tell it, I'll get back to you later, not go away, because it won't do that. It's stronger than we are. So the organic part, has to do with um, be open, just be ready for it, and just know that some, there are going to be some times. I'm, I'm sure I'll be doing this, you know, for a while because the deeper and the longer the relationship, the more important the relationship, the longer we grieve for people. It's just a way of honoring them. So, the organic part is is great, and just don't get, don't let your client get busy, or oh my gosh, don't let your client get in their head and spiritualize, and you know, Becky's dancing in heaven and all that crazy stuff, or she's singing in heaven. That doesn't comfort people very much. You just be with them. You know, go back to, to Job in chapter four where he'd lost everything. And the only good thing those three yahoos did and in, in, in there it said that they sat with him seven days and seven nights and did not say a word to him because they knew his grief was very, very great and very deep. So um, you gotta be ready for this. But I also discovered an intentional part of this, which is the next part of your outline, your handout what we call the structured aspect. And this is more intentional because I started thinking when mom died, now I always want to honor her, but I don't want to be grieving forever. I mean, I'll, I'll always miss her. I mean, you miss people you love, but I don't want to be in that disruptive process where I'm always, it's kind of getting in the way of my sleep cycles and getting in the way of my relationships and getting in the way of my energy because I just can't get off my mind. You expect that for a while with somebody that you lost that you love. You expect that, but I didn't want that to be my whole life. I wanted to be moved from the grief state to the memory state. And so um, what I did is, is I did some stuff that was, I thought was very, very helpful, and I'll give it to you, and you can use it with your clients or yourself. It's helpful to me. I decided um, that... Um, I would go and have some grief times. So since I'm in California, we live near the beach, um, I went down to the ocean, Pacific Ocean. And uh, for one, once a day for several days, I, I'd go down there and I would just, the ocean kind of, it'd be like if you were near the mountains or the desert or if you're near a park or woods or whatever, it's some place where you feel God and nature together and it was quiet, not a lot of people around. And what I did, was I created a structure where I began reviewing my relationship with my mother from my earliest memory to the last time I ever saw her at the assisted living home. And I went through those memories and thought what I needed to think about them and felt what I needed to feel about them, and then I got the next one and the next one. And what happened was it was really good. I began to use review, on a cognitive and an emotional level. You'll probably see this in a, in a book, you know me. And uh, it was overwhelming. I was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing, uh, especially with some of these great memories of things that she was for me. She was such a good person and so warm. And, and I found myself saying, I wrote down the things I was saying. I was saying things like, thank you. Just thanks for all you did for, for me. And, and I miss you, because I missed her terribly. Thank you, I miss you. Uh, I'm sorry for X. That was for my junior high years. <laughs> I had to apologize. Um, I need to forgive you for X 
because I got to let you off and, you know, cancel a debt to you. I don't want to hold on to that. I love you. God bless you. Those, what's that, six, one, two, six-ish? They just kept coming over my mind, and I just kept saying them out loud. And, you know, I would just cry my eyes out. And then I get back in the car to go back home, and I felt my brain was clear. I felt fresh. I was tired. You know, Brene Brown calls up, talks about the vulnerability hangover. I had that. But I felt so great. And I went back over and over and over again, and I still do it somewhat. That has really helped. And, and, and think about the context of life. You've got the five contexts. You've got work. You've got social and church. You've got your life team. You've got you by yourself. You've got you and God. And how do you best grieve? Now, work is the hardest because you're at work and it's not a lot of space to do that. Uh, social and church can't really, you know, it's kind of hard to do when everybody's reading the Bible or worshiping. Uh, your life team should be a great place. You yourself with your own thoughts are a great place and you and God. So there's places to go for it, to be intentional about it. And um, my, my, uh, what I found is my brain is clearer and I feel like I'm using the good stuff. So that's just a little tip. Uh, I'm still researching it, but here's the point. Everything that I've studied that the Bible and the neuroscience say is even truer. Well, it's always been true, but more real to me, and I'm building on that foundation. It's good stuff. Then I want to wrap up here um, in um, the helping others because you know, we're helping roles, therapists and counselors and all that, and talk about some things. I told, I told this, uh, this information um, to the crowd at Saddleback when uh, Rick Warren, you know, I'm um, a friend of Rick's, and I, I preach at his, at his church when he needs me to. Uh, I preached um, this is the weekend after his son, Matthew, uh, killed himself. He killed himself on a Wednesday, and I was, we had nobody expected it. Um, and I was speaking, and so I, I asked for permission to kind of add a little coaching piece, and they let me do that. So here's what I told them, and this is what you can use for your clients, was I said, now Rick and Kay are going to be in incredible pain and sorrow kind of sequestered for some amount of time. They need to, and they've got, they've got God, they've got their people around them, they're fine. But when they begin to emerge in life, let me tell you some do's and don'ts. It was just kind of a coaching session. I said, first, when they come back, um, they need a lot of grace, mainly the grace of quietness and presence and acceptance and validation of feelings, all that stuff you've learned about attunement. They really need that, but they also need space. You know, like, instead of walking up to him and saying, um, hey, I've got to tell you, your son's doing great now. He's in a lot less pain. That's just, don't do that. Don't, don't use it for a little sermonette. Uh, just say, how are you doing? And what I found, how are you doing is great, because e either Rick will say, uh, I'm good, I'm fine. I just had a long session with my, you know, my accountability group, and we prayed and talked or whatever. And um, I think so the, the grace part and the space part, and he might say, I'm fine, I want to talk about baseball or weather. Then you say, that's great. Or he might say, you know, my son's coming up in my mind, I'd love to talk to you and let me talk to you. So you're giving him the grace of I'm for you and I'm attuned to you that we've all been trained about, but also the space of it's your time. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to modify my anxiety, which is really what it is, by giving you some statement about how well it's in a better place now and I offer the good. We know that's true, but there's some times to not use those verses. Um, something else I found out, very, very helpful. Ask them about the person that they lost. So you're feeling weird, like, can I bring over some chicken pot pie? Well, nobody cares. Or, you know, what can I do for you? I mean, you can bring over meals, it's great, but that's not like the, the solution solution. In fact, I liked it when people sent us gifts and flowers. But ask about, tell me about the person. Tell me about Jim. Tell me about Sam. Tell me about Sally. And if you ask about the person, they get into the person and they start having great memories and you become part of that. And they have feelings and feelings are messy, but they need to have them and you're a safe person. So when you ask about the person, it's very, very powerful. And don't wrap it up in the positive bow. You know, it's okay to stop in a Psalm 88 way. You guys know Psalm 88? It's the only Psalm of the 150 that does not end up with praise. You know, David talks about his pain and his struggle, and he ends up most of the time saying, you are for me, and you love me, and you'll always be with me, and I praise you. Read Psalm 88. It just says, darkness has overwhelmed me. Have a nice day. And, and the theologians, and I agree with these guys and gals, I believe that um, God gave us that passage just to say, sometimes grace just means, if you can end up on a negative, that's still fine. You don't have to put the Christian bow on things and 
that's just a way to get rid of anxiety anyway, and because people can't take care of, take, can't, can't handle feelings. And I know that sometimes was really hard, and I'm, it was a tough time, and I'm so sorry, I'm glad we spent our time together. So, you're gonna grieve, they're gonna grieve. As you know, my belief is that most of the time, the end result of really good psychotherapy is grief. You know, people come in with a symptom, one of the three Ps, personal, people, or performance, and then you find out they've got character issues, attachment, differentiation, integration, adulthood, and we find out they did, had a big mess and they don't have the right grace and truth and time as nutrients, and you start working with those things. And what are those symptoms are, they start getting better, and they go through stages, so they get angry because they never had a voice, or they get sad because they've had to be strong or whatever, and then they maybe have a substance thing, of drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever, and as they're getting all this done, a lot of times in, in very successful psychotherapies, their very last season is, I'm sad because this is over and I really like my counselor and my counselor's a good person and I'm gonna miss them. They've been a very good reparative attachment to me and you help them through that. Help them to let go of you. Help them to let go of their losses. Some are gonna have to lose families and old ideas of themselves and dreams that aren't good dreams for them or that will never happen. You help them grieve well. It is that important. So I hope it's helpful because I, it is it's helping me at a level, level that I never thought, and it should help all of us to be better healers. All right. Hey, we got a really good time now because we're going to have one of my favorite people and somebody that you guys know and you probably read his books and followed him. His name is John Baker, and John is the founder of uh, Celebrate Recovery, which has changed hundreds and th probably millions of people to find Christ at a deeper level and help them with, with hurts, hangups, and um, habits that aren't good for them. So he's gonna be here live in studio with me. And guess what now? As soon as uh, I finish my interview with him about what he wants to say to help you guys and teach you, you're gonna be able to talk to him personally, ask him questions. You can walk away saying, hey, I talked to John Baker today. Let's go have dinner. He's, but he's a great guy, uh, one of my close, close friends, and you're gonna enjoy this. All right, so stay tuned.